So much of that has been obscured by the images of the famine and the relentless civil war. So what we do know about this country is that it is in the midst of much suffering. Our senior correspondent, Brian Stewart, is no stranger to Africa and its history. And tonight, to help us understand a little more about Somalia, he has prepared this background report. So I'm starting with this piece. This is actually um, available through the CBC, um, CBC archives. And um, it shows the Somalia affair. So I'm going to tell you people are familiar with what the Somalia affair actually is, other than like far up the back, Rashmi Lou, the professor. Um, OK, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I have to sort of set the stage a bit. Um, I'm not going to play the clips, because some of the clips are actually quite disturbing. Um, but basically, um, during the, the crisis in Somalia, um, we actually sent peacekeepers. So Canada sent peacekeepers. And there was an incident, the actual image is uh, related to that incident, came out in 95. Uh, basically, it ends up that our peacekeepers were involved in um, the, the beating and torture and, and, and murder of a 16 year old Somali um, boy. Um, we know about this because they took pictures of it, um, which I'm not, I'm not going to show. Um, and then also, other video footage was shown of you know, our peacekeepers um, joking about shooting, you know, wanting to shoot more teenagers, um, using the N-word to refer to the people that they were supposedly protecting. Um, and, and basically, it, it really showed an attitude that seemed to be almost sort of celebrating the fact that they were, um, you know, it was a lot of, it was very similar, very similar to Abu Ghraib. Like, when Abu Ghraib came out in terms of the photos like that, it was very similar in terms of those kind of photos. Now, the story of the Somali affair um, was, I think, is important to bring up because when, um, what we're gonna be talking about with the Ground Jam today is sort of, how um, the, you know how the, the media coverage of the Somali community in the 90s to now has impacted the integration of the community, and I think what has to be understood is that as you know the community was coming in, we had this we had this other story going on about Canada um, having to sort of uh, realize that our peacekeepers we really really were very proud of, and at that point in time in the 90s we you know we weren't involved in the compact we were peacekeeping had done something so disgraceful that. Um, it was, we were sort of calling into question um, how we thought about ourselves. So I will be referring to the Somalia affair, and I really do recommend people do actually go to check this out as well. It's an important part of Canadian history, which um, actually has, unfortunately, the fact that we don't know about it is actually very disturbing because it's a major issue in our military history. So this is at Karam Jana. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I'm Ikram Jama, I live in Aruba, and I've lived here for the last 18 years. And I know Shelby very well from the community, and I thought she, I would She used to be my boss. boss. <laughs> and all these girls should know about her, because she created the program. Yeah. So I thought I would be supporting her program, so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> on Oprah Shelby. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So, um, again, we have to be close on time because you and I can talk for hours. But um, I really want you to sort of um, give a picture um, when you first came here in 1992. Um, were you aware of how the media was covering your community when you first came? And maybe you could talk a bit about how the stories evolved and also reflecting on how the story of the Somali affair also impacted the community in terms of thinking, you know. Because um, I know myself, um, as a young black girl, um, when I watched that footage in 1995, it made me feel scared to be a Canadian as a black person because, you know, they were referring to the N-word, and I was like, these are Canadian guys walking around guns saying this in another country. What are they doing here? And just wondering how that also affects the community in terms of, like, we just came into this country already. It's really cold. And then we also have this to deal with. Well, um, if I try to tell the stories of the last 18 years, it's going to take a long time. And I love stories. But I think uh, I'm going to try to just give you a bit of a historical overview uh, of some of the things that I, um, that I remember when I was part of. And why uh, can I comment on this? I guess because I was part of the community uh, as a young Somali person at the time. And also um, uh, worked with the Somali community 
as an activist, as an organizer. So I'm coming from both a service provider and, and a community member. So 1992, Ottawa was um, very new to me. I moved from Toronto uh, for school and I was in the country for three years. So my community in Ottawa in 1992, very young community, very new community, a lot of families with lots of children who are now adults. Um, some of them are here. So we are here probably, yeah. And so I think we were coming, basically, the Ottawa community, larger community, didn't know much about the Somalis, except what was coming through the media, and that was basically about the civil war, um, being refugees, how we got here. Um, so the first coverage wasn't so bad, except it was quite victimizing, um, really talking about that they were really refugees, and they came through a civil war, and they are poor, and they are struggling. Um, most of it true but didn't really capture any other aspects of what the Somalis brought. Um, from a biased perspective, I would say we brought quite a lot, but that wasn't really in, 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 in the media. And so then, after a while, we started getting from sympathy to actually now being questioned, and, and we, you know, every newcomer immigrant, from the Japanese to the earlier times, we know every community goes through its own initiation period, where they're actually interrogated, questioned, and that's normal, but I think with the Somali experience, um, it was kind of different. Um, immigrants from Africa, I think we were the largest African um, Muslim group that arrived, so we brought a lot of difference. You were the largest African group. African in Ottawa, yes. And, yeah. and so we looked different, we acted different, we dressed diff uh, differently. Um, and even though I think we had a lot of similarities with a lot of people, the difference was more highlighted than the similarities. Um, so the portrayal was they were highly uneducated, uh, struggling, they did not fit in with Canadian society. They're so different. Should they really be here? Will they will they survive? And I think one of the things that I, as a young student in one classroom, I remember the discussion came up, and I was confused because I told them uh, most Somalis that are in Ottawa actually are the middle class, educated class. So it's not. We know when war has happened, the people who leave first are not the poor. We know the people with money will get out, the people with professions will get out, the people who could get visas will get out. So the Somalis who were here were really not the poor people. Those who are still in the refugee camps in neighboring countries. Um, they were highly educated, highly skilled, uh, middle class aspirations and dreams. And so the portrayal and the reality were not fitting in for many of us. Um, but at the time, because we were a young community and, and also learning and confused, there was no voice to counter what was happening in the media. So it was just but the Canadians were hearing were these things. Um, but some of my friends here will remember, we did a lot of work um, as students from Calgary University, or the U. Uh, we tried to educate the Canadian public. We had big dreams and a lot of confidence. And so we did workshops, we had pamphlets. Um, and whenever we have an audience like this and we talk about Somali the way we know, and it becomes positive, then there will be another hairline. Oh, now they're collecting one fellow, and the women is Somali, and we're like, oh. That is so it's really bad. So to compete with the hairlines was very heavy. And I think on a personal note, I remember uh, four friends of my, me and my three friends would meet every Thursday at Orbido. There used to be a Tim Martins. And so about three of us went to Calvary University, one was going to Algonquin. And so we all met there to have breakfast, cheap breakfast, like bagels and tea. <laughs> and it was the highlight of the week, so every Thursday. And when the Somalia, before the Somali affair, but the media started talking about the, the war and the clans and how they're sending money back home. We were so busy because four of us would be there speaking Somali and loud, people knew. So we decided not to go to Tim Hortons. We were like, this is really not good because the media images were so bad and the allegations, we actually felt embarrassed to go to Tim Hortons. Um, and the building still had to have breakfast, so we moved to Calvary University, a uh, low building in the basement, which became our headquarters for four years. So I think, um, so those were some of the things that I think I can remember and how we struggled. And then the whole issue of um, FGM and that can became also... Can you explain what that is? Not everyone knows what that is. Yes. FGM is female genital mutilation. Um, I don't use that term. I use female circumcision and I won't get into that. But I think when that practice came into the media in a very sensational, uh, out of context, uh, blaming way, a lot of us really didn't have the capacity to engage with the media on it. When we tried, it didn't come out well. And I think we decided not to engage with the media. And it was a conscious decision not to really discuss this issue. But it did kind of uh, portray our culture um, in a very, very interestingly backward way. And the whole Somaliness became about FGM for a while. 
people really liked it. So if people saw you, all they wanted to discuss was, did you go through this thing? <laughs> and the next thing was, tell me more. So I think something so bright and so different, so kind of not really something people would address, uh, became the norm. In, in many, I remember one time we were in Parliament, on Parliament Hill, many Somali students trying to talk about some law, refugee law, and people came up to us and talked about FGM. <laughs> Um, so, so those were the, the, the things, and I think I just want to highlight what were the positives of going through some things like that, and I will talk about it with, uh, later more maybe. It was really the community in Ottawa organized. We have finally found um, the, the, the energy and the voice to actually come together and do our own advocacy um, at whatever spaces we can. So it was a lot of negative, but I think the positive was a community that really became very active. We, we went through the social service a lot. Most of, a lot of Somalis now are in, that, um, in the helping profession for a reason, because we thought we had the best people to provide service to the community, we the best people to speak on behalf of the community. And I really think, even though it was negative, that what it did uh, was quite uh, kind of galvanized people. So in terms of, I mean, so that was the 90s, but in terms of now, how do you think um, the media materials are? I mean, yes, it's, it's a bit more balanced. I mean, you know, one of the you know, biggest Canadian star stars is Kanan, he's Somali. Um, and, you know, there's, and in Ottawa, you know, those are the people who are um, closest to the words, you know that you know, we have some amazing uh, young Somali women poets. But um, in terms of the general picture, I mean, how do you see how the, the portrayals have changed? Do you feel that there's been a change? Um, there has been a change. I think it change because the Somali community after 20 some years um, is mature now and I think there is a lot of positive voices from the community and allies also. It's not only the Somalis who are addressing. There are a lot of people in, Canada, in Ottawa who are not Somali who know um, about the community, who work with the community. Um, so allies and I think advocacy is really good. We have a lot of spoken word poets um, who are doing a lot of art. And uh, you know, kind of going back to the Somali tradition of poetry, and even though they're using a different genre, which is very North American, um, they're still telling their stories in arts, and that's a very positive thing. But I think it's, the negativity hasn't finished, and I think we go through stages, so we moved away from FGM, not a lot of people will talk about it now, but now we have the pirate issue, because there's a lot of Somali pirates around. Um, even my son knows about pirates, I think it's, it's a good thing. Um, <laughs> so how old is he again? Is he mad at it? He's five. So, so I got a sword from the dollar store, a pirate store, so, you know, but I think um, the pirate issue is, is a lot in, in the media, and even though we're here, and we're not in Somalia, most Somali community groups are, you know, Canadian at this point, I think it still connects us to the homeland in a bad way. The other thing is the whole uh, issue of Muslim terrorism, and there's allegations against young Muslim men, and they share that with other young Muslim men a lot, and that's really been uh, a very um, negative coverage, I find. So a lot of the times we find it affects more the young males than the young females, whatever comes up, the pirate issue, the terrorist issue, the gang issue. So there are still negativity around, and a lot of work to be done. Okay, so we're just gonna talk um, a bit about some creative um, aspects of communities taken. So I'm actually gonna show a clip, but before I show a clip, I'm wondering if you can tell me a bit about the film Family Motel. Yes, and I know you're your friend over there was involved in making it. Yeah. So. Well, Family Motel is um, a film slash documentary that addresses uh, homelessness in Canada. And the producer, they chose a Somali family to follow and see how that, and this is a fictional Somali family, it's not a real Somali family. The actor is actually a social worker, and the daughters are acting in it. And so the co producer is sitting over there, and it's for that, she knows more than I. But it's really a very um, interesting. Um, uh, kind of grassroots community involvement was really high, um, so we were consulted and a lot of people were consulted, and so it was really well done, I find. So I'm going to cut show a clip from Manning Motel, which was filmed here in Ottawa again. Um, and it's interesting, but when was talking about writing a novel in Ottawa, this film set in Ottawa, um, beyond we're talking about representation, the reality is in terms of Canadian cinema and literature, Ottawa is not depicted very often. That's another thing just to think about. Ottawa is, even though it's nation's capital, is not actually part of the creative space of this country. Okay. Dr. Ali, what's going on? It doesn't look like it's on. It was on. It was on? Okay. Oh, because it's black and I'm an idiot. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Koch. Ayala. Can I talk to you, please? 
You know, I'm just running out the door. The office is about to close in three minutes. It's an emergency. It's urgent. Please, Mr. Cook. I really need to speak to you about my housing situation. Listen, there's nothing that I found. I saw something for $950, but it's out of your price range. I'll see what I can do tomorrow. I'll, I'll try to uh, see if there's a way I need there. your help to get out of that hotel and get into some safe place with my children. I am about to lose my children. There are things happening in that motel that are going to affect my children for life. Do you understand, Mr. Cook? I do understand, but we've talked about this before. There's a huge waiting list, and I'm, I'm really trying the best I can. I have lost half of my family in my country. I've lost my country. I've come from war. I've been trying to establish myself in this country since the day I got here. The only things left in my life are those children. And if I don't get out of there, I'm going to lose them. circle of activists from so your generation of activists, um, some of whom are here, was many went into the social service field. Um, but that meant um, that what I found interesting, because my own background is growing up in subsidized housing, so my perspective on those small communities was different. Everyone else was sort of reading about them. They were my neighbors. Um, but one of the things I found really fascinating was that it was a new community, but it was a new community that actually took on issues that have been plaguing Ottawa for years. So for example, our really horrible housing situation. Ottawa is a very expensive place to live. So if you have um, you know, issues of um, your low income, I know there's a person sitting right here who actually, that's one of her jobs is around um, income security and housing security. Um, it's very hard to find a place to live. Um, another problem is um, the standard at the school. So there's certain concepts called beacon schools. So often schools that are in areas that are very low income, the standard of those schools are very low. Um, there's also this, the situation of conditions at um, the Ottawa Cross Detention Center, which also are very poor. Um, these are issues that um, many members of the small community have actually taken a lead on bringing forward and bringing the public's attention. These issues existed even before the small community came. But I would say the level of activism and the, the passion behind that activism really wasn't there. And so I'm just wanting you to reflect on, you know, where does this activist spirit come from in this community? Um, that you know, just sort of new kids on the block, but you know, it's really sort of um, move forward and, and addressing these issues. Because in many ways, this film uh, was a collective effort on the part of the you know, members of the Somali community in Ottawa to bring forward this issue of housing insecurity. And the film's been used to educate people about housing insecurity. That's one example of, of the many things the Somali community has done to bring forward issues, which, again, don't just affect the Somali community, you're affecting many people in Ottawa. Well, I think from my perspective, and of course, uh, I'm only one person, but I think from what I remember, the Somali community, when they started becoming residents of the Ottawa housing, and not everybody was there, but some, a lot of families were there. Um, it wasn't something they chose. They came, they were refugees, they didn't have jobs yet, they were poor. So you needed a housing and you, and you have had children. I mean, this was the logical place to be. And I think what, what was interesting was a lot of people in those housing were not poor back in their home country. So they were not really used to living um, in, in those conditions. But at the same time, um, I, we always talk about what do we bring as immigrants. And sometimes we don't really, a lot of us do not bring the culture forward for different reasons. But I think with the Somalis, um, one of the things we brought was we are not a class-based society generally. Um, even though we had professions and middle class, but the class did not really um, clear divisions among people. If your brother was a middle class, wanted to be a doctor, and you were poor, you were expected to actually share some of that wealth. So when we came, poverty or being poor was not really something that you internalized. Um, it wasn't an identity, it was something that you need to, so if you need to advocate for your housing, you advocate for it. And if you got a social housing, some Somali who we worked with renovated the basement. And they created very interesting basements because they wanted good places uh, for their kids to hang out. And some of the workers were confused, how do you want to afford this, how do you want to afford that? Well, I'm going to collect my money and do whatever I can have. You know, I'm clean, but I need a basement that really works. So I think, I think some of the things that I witnessed was, was that, and when I was working in those housing areas, I worked with Canadians who are poor as well. And, and, um, and it was difficult for me to understand some of the different, and some of the Canadians were actually also advocating for themselves um, in the end. But this, so, so I think maybe that um, you know, this class idea was not really entrenched in them. I think they, 
they did not shy away from uh, wanting to live, to have something better, even though they didn't have the money uh, or didn't have the class to, to actually want certain things, right? So it was kind of the, the audacity of not thinking poverty to be a condition of your life. It, it is just a period of time, and it's not an identity, and you don't have to really be humble by it. I think be humble to be kind of respectful, but you don't have to be coward, and, and so I think that's what it was going to So it was the audacity of the community. So this is a community with a bit of reputation for audacity. Yes, anthropologists have written about this. But I think it definitely was a good thing for Ottawa. Um, so the last thing we're going to reflect on a bit is um, you do some writing. You, you write sometimes, I know you're a bit of a closet poet, but you also write some articles. Um, and, and recently you wrote, wrote an op-ed um, for the Ottawa Citizen. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us a bit about the original concept behind that op-ed and how it was edited and the reaction to that. And that's actually the, the, the part we'll wrap up on. So um, I guess it was a small um, piece. It was a letter to the editor. And I wrote it when uh, I think I wrote it when there was an arrest of few, a uh, couple of uh, young men who were of Muslim uh, background and the terrorist allegations that came with that. And I just wrote the piece to the citizen. Um, I think in probably frustration of some of the comments that I was hearing uh, from the community, from the media, um, of blaming the whole community for. What was not proven yet, it was an allegation at the time, it was few um, individuals. But again, I felt we were all kind of indicted again. And um, I, I just wrote it quickly, I sent it to the, to, to the letter, um, to the editor. Um, and I think the title I wrote at the time, when Shelby and I talked about it, was uh, In Search of Kinship, Being a Muslim in Ottawa. And what I was trying to address was, every time we try to really get closer, as a community, a large community, Muslim and non-Muslim, something like that comes again. And then the division starts, and uh, somehow I felt, here I am again, I have to answer to my fellow Canadians that I'm a Muslim, that I'm peaceful, that I'm actually good. And I really didn't want to go there anymore, and I was saying, what will it take to actually find kinship? And when this happens, we don't have to feel. We're all indicted, but we actually feel as a community. Something happened, and the law will take care of it, or maybe it will be done early. Um, um, in, in, in the criminal justice system. So I think, when I sent the article, they liked it, they were going to publish it. And uh, some editing, obviously, and I, I left with me before, so I know editing. But they changed, they changed the whole title. Like, I don't think they understood the complexity of what I was trying to. The kinship piece was too hard, maybe, or you know, media sometimes wants some simple things. So the article became, I'm sad. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 Then when, if you read, if, when I heard some of the comments, people were really very sympathetic and said, don't be sad, we really want you to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we want people like Grand Chara to be in Canada and make me into a guest and the other Canadians, uh, this is their country. So I think that's the kind of people I do not want. Uh, because I do consider myself to be very much a Canadian uh, poor person. Uh, I don't need permission from fellow Canadians to let me come here. But the conversation that I wanted was in that, but I got the guest one, and, I, and you know, if I'm staying, please stay, and I'm like, okay, I'll be <laughs> So I think, I, I think when we write something, like we were talking about earlier, sometimes we want to engage with the media, but when we engage, we can't control what comes out. We will give an interview, if it cuts, you know, they will have one sentence and maybe out of context. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't get it, and I think we have to keep working at it. I think that's the, the, 